I'm John Bassler. This is the John Bassler Show. It's after 8 a.m. Hiroshima time, August 6, 1945. Three B-29s in the very clear sky above Hiroshima are approaching in tandem. One falls away, necessary evil. That's the observation plane. It falls way back. But Great Artiste and uh, Nola Gay are to drop packages at the same time. There's only one bomb. What is Great Artiste dropping? Great Artiste is dropping these three packages that are going to monitor uh, certain types of radiation, gamma rays, neutron spray, and also the physical force of the bomb from three different points over the city. They have photography equipment on board. I think that there was a motion camera that Waldman, I have a note here, Waldman forgot to initiate it. There were still photos, but at this point they're still not uh, over I would say they were not overindulged with observation equipment. There's the, very much the feel that they've got certain things, but they don't have others. Is this because of the secrecy or because they didn't have big meetings about this? Why, are, why aren't there more observation points? Why aren't there more attention to photography? Well, a lot of the film was damaged. Waldman, he had an idea what was going to be dropped. And in the excitement of the moment, as the plane had to do this tremendous acrobatic twist away from the direction the bomb was falling. And he had a good view, but he was focused on what he was seeing and apparently just forgot to hit the shutter button to catch that ultra-slow motion of those first 15 seconds of the detonation. Let's talk about the twist. This is called the Tibbetts Maneuver, or you'd have to say the really stupid maneuver. He knows, he's figured out with geometry, that you're not going to fly straight ahead, which is what a bombing run does. You want to get as far away from the explosion as possible. So how does he do it? Well, originally, some people called it the boneheaded maneuver because it sounded so strange. You're dropping a bomb toward the ground, and then you're going to dive your planes at the ground. Now, Tibbetts uh, was brilliant when it came to geometry of these situ- of many situations, and He knew that the bomb would travel almost four miles forward before detonating 43 seconds after being dropped, and that if you went at a right angle, the bomb would continue going forward. And if you twist, kept twisting back and used gravity to accelerate the plane, you could be not only four miles away but the bomb, but going backward against the path of the bomb and be nine miles away. And he wanted those planes to be as far away as they could be because no one, for one, knew exactly how powerful the blast would be. Didn't know what was... They didn't know if it had worked. They didn't know if it had worked really well. They didn't know what their exposure was. They really didn't know. 81445 is the note I have here, Charlie. They emitted a high-pitched whine that was a signal to both aircraft. When that whine stopped, that was released bomb? Right. There were four objects released, three of Luis Alvarez monitoring packages and the atomic bomb. Okay, 815, 15 seconds, August 6, 1945. The bomb is away from 9 kilometers. It's going to fall till about 1,200 feet. I think I have this, 1,900 feet or 1,200 feet. It's going to fall, and then it's going to detonate in air. Uh, at that point, you want to be very far away from it, but they don't know what it's going to look like. They've been told to look away. But they don't all look away. Some of them turn towards it. Sweeney takes his goggles off and great artiste. Right. Sweeney was flying away from the bomb, so he was looking directly away from it, trying to put as much distance between himself and the bomb. And he wanted to see his instruments. He wanted to see how uh, far the plane was falling. And uh, then the he said it was like hundreds of suns directly in front of him, even though the bomb detonated behind him. Yes, they, 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 those, no one was blinded. They didn't have that happen to them, but they did have a phenomenon that Charlie is detailed, even though we don't have a complete explanation for it. They felt metal or the taste of metal or the taste of iron in their mouths after the explosion. Why? Those who had fillings in their mouths, uh, when the bomb detonated, there were uh, particles within the tamper system, even the uranium, that are ionized. That's to be stripped of your electrons and some of them, almost as if they were in an atomic accelerator, would have been accelerated up to between 30 and 90 percent the speed of light. And very briefly, the bomb created these magnetic field lines, and particles could be traveling along those curved lines, almost like the lines you see on the surface of the sun. 
and uh, traveling along those lines right through the plains. We know that they did because we see the mar- trails of them in goggles and in the plexiglass on the plains. There is no cheering after the bomb explodes because they do look down. Everybody sees different things. They're looking into something never described before, so they're all searching for metaphor. One I have is a field of boiling black tar. What were they seeing? Right. Uh, To Tibbetts, it looked like Hiroshima, seconds after the bomb, that the city itself was a field of boiling black tar. Uh, Jacob Bezier said it reminded him of when you go into the water at the beach and uh, and you move your feet around with uh, and the sand is forming these cauliflower billows under the water. He loved the sea, and even though he continued sailing after the war, he could not bring himself to go walk through and stir up the sand with his feet again, ever again. The cloud rises very quickly. What's in that cloud? It's uh, the material. A lot of it is the material that was vaporized on the ground in the top fill few couple millimeters of the roofs of buildings, of trees that were vaporizing, wood, people, everything near the hypocenter and out to almost uh, a little more than a half mile away. One of the crewmen looking down said when he saw the flash, the ground instantly turned black. And he realized later that that was the smoke starting to rise from objects being disintegrated on the ground. And then, of course, there was the blast wave and this huge fireball rising into the sky. There was a subdued mood, Charlie, you report a subdued mood. Uh, Captain Robert Lewis is the co-pilot in Enola Gay. Tibbetts says he's going to be back and get some sleep because he's exhausted of the night's work. He's going to go to the back of the aircraft. Lewis writes down in his diary afterwards, my God, what have we done? When did he write that right. down? Uh, probably within a couple of minutes afterward, uh, the radar fusing operator Jacob Bezier heard in his earphones Lewis yelling initially, my God, look at that son of a bitch go. And then he paused and said, my God. And then minutes later, he wrote, my God, what have we done? There was a war on. There were other thoughts. Sweeney, for example, less of them. Or there are fewer of them now. Did he think that at the time or was that when he got back? Uh, on the plane, looking down during the minutes after, cause, because they circled around to get pictures and to see what happened, and most of them had kind of that thought that if we have to invade the mainland, at least there are fewer of the enemy now. They had heard stories that the population was being trained to fight against any Americans coming aboard. Then Sweeney, when they got back to Tinian Island and... The next day when there was no word that Japan appeared to be surrendering and he was told that there were two potential targets for the next city, we're going to have to do this again, Sweeney had to go find a priest. Let's go to the ground because the bomb's gone off. To hell and back, Charles Pellegrino, I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show.